what transpires. Joining us to talk about that, about his program, and about his significant career, the uh, master of disaster. No, just kidding. What are we going to call this guy, Ed? You got something good? Legend. Legend. Oh, okay. Legend. All right. Most significant coaching tree of anybody in Louisiana? Soothsayer. Soothsayer. A prognosticator. Troublemaker. No, no. Referee no. baiter. Well, I'd have oh, made I'll quit all that now. Well, they're, they're holding. Understand. They're holding. They're holding, Ed. They're holding on every play. They're holding. Coach, were they holding on every play? Every play. Every no play. doubt. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Hank Tierney, a bunch of Tula joining us now. Great, great we, we story. Say, we say that in love, okay? But, but go ahead, Ed. Uh, great story. Coach Hank, coach in West Jeff. Middle of the season, we're there, games in the fourth quarter. It's close. Coach has given it to the refs. They're holding, they're holding, they're holding. And then he comes over and looks at me and he says, that wasn't holding. <laughs> <laughs> so make like, sure you understand, we were never holding. We never holding. Every play, and no yeah. question about it. I, I laugh because uh, we think the world of, of Hank, he's, he's one of the truly best to ever do this, and he's a good guy too. But it's really funny, and I mentioned the coaching tree, and we've talked about it many times. I think nine head coaches, but I can get that straight with him. But having said that, when you talk to some of the others, they always tell stories about him, and they laugh about it. They talk about it. You know, when you ask Sanji about it, when you ask Hildebrand about it, when you ask Roth about it, when you talk to all these guys that coach with him, they all tell the same funny stories. And then, of course, they end up coaching against him, and, and he hates him. He wants to kill him and everything else. And, and you know, it's really funny. Sanji says, you know, he says, we come out of the locker room. We get to the, you know, we get to the sideline. And I'm at Brother Martin. He says, as soon as we get to the sideline, he says, it's, it's five, ten minutes. You know, you run through the, the, the end zone with the, the paper cutout that the cheerleaders have. You get to the sideline, and you're just getting to the sideline. And he's got two officials over there, and he's screaming and yelling, and he's signaling, hold. They're holding. They're holding on every play. Of course, Mark's an <laughs> offensive line coach, so he's all over that. He says, he yeah, I mean, he's, he's got them before, before kickoff even starts, right? Well, you learn the tricks of the trade. You got it, man. <laughs> coach, you taught you Actually, that Actually, what I'm doing is trying doing to get Brother Martin a penalty because they, they so took too long to get on the field. Oh, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you got, you got five you got minutes from 720 to uh, 6.55 to get on the field. But that's the first move. That's the first move. <laughs> coach, now, wait, I've learned that from JT. 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 All you snakes, I'll tell you what, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> coach, when are we going to have football? Man, we got good news yeah, we got Wednesday. Good news we got the Wednesday. memo from Eddie, Eddie Bonine, Bonine, Bonine saying that uh, starting Monday that we can put helmets on, and then Thursday we can put shoulder pads on. Shoulder now, pads. we're still in groups of 25, like you said, still small groups and uh, still no contact, but we all, the coaches you know, that I spoke to, took that as a very positive sign that really Mr. Bonine was saying, get ready, you know, games are around the corner, and that's what we open. We open. Just looking at the calendar, though, it, it might be tight to have a game, um, you know, in early September. Don't you agree? I agree. I think. I, agree. I think. I think. I think. Can you seriously that it's all it depends on when the governor puts us in phase three? You know, if we get it from the time we get into phase three, I think we two or three weeks from playing a game. Now he could put us in phase three as early as a week from Monday, although a lot of people do not think that'll happen. But we're going by his phases, and as fast as we get to phase three, then, you know, like I said, three weeks, I think we'll be playing against another opponent. So when when does school start in Tangipo Parish, Coach? Teachers report Thursday, okay, August 6th, and we have what's called a soft start, which is the following uh, Wednesday, I think the uh, 12th. And we are virtual the first month, because the first week they're putting the kids in, you know, to – basically go through a virtual schedule with them. But then after that first week, it's virtual through Labor Day, which, of course, would be very different for everyone. Right. So, um, you know, I'm I just, just talking to a bunch of coaches and a bunch of people involved with this, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who, who feel like it's like, you know, they're hoping for mid-September where we'd miss a week or two. Do you think that's a, a, a realistic projection? I do, and I think we saw what the SEC did. You know, I think we all know that 
you know, John Bell well, was an ex-quarterback at A.B. High School, incidentally, is a huge football fan. And I think that, uh, you know, he wants us to play. And I think when we saw the SEC is going to play September 26th, and with the rationale being, you know, don't get started too early, let things sort out, I think that's going to be passed down to us. Now, do I think it'll be that late? Maybe not, but I think you guys are both right. I don't see us playing on time, but hopefully just two or three weeks later. And I also hope once we do start, we will play on through. Whoever is fortunate enough to get to the playoffs and get to the Dome will, it will be extended possibly to Christmas or into 2021 because that has also been mentioned by Mr. Bonan. So I hope that can happen as well. As well. The holidays. Play right. The holidays. That's right. Yeah, and he said and that. And he be said in favor that. of doing that. Have huh? No problem with that. No problem with oh yeah, that. I, I am. You know, I I think you know that it hopefully it can be worked out for all the other sports. But you know, I definitely I hate to you know I hate to see the kids lose anything. You know, I, a baseball coach of mine, Stu and I, they're good friends, and it was it was really heartbreaking as hard as them guys work to get ready to play baseball and see what happened to them, what happened to their kids. You know, it's horrible. So I'm hoping we can make it work. You know, uh, one of the things that I'm kind of curious about, let's just say we get into the playoffs. You're in the playoffs. you got a big playoff game. We know who your best player is, your quarterback. He's outstanding. Right. At some point, right. at some point late in the week, he's got the game plan. He's got it down. You kind of put him uh, on ice somewhere where he wouldn't have contact with people. So he would be <laughs> absolutely, without question, ready to run on the field Friday night and play. Have you thought about that at all? And, you know, I think that is the biggest problem with the virus. And we've already had to deal with it. We had, a, we, you know, we we're our groups. We we're our groups of, of 25. And we had an, a young offensive lineman four weeks ago test positive. So the entire offensive line group was quarantined for two weeks. Okay, so the problem as I see it, and I don't know, how to fix the problem, but they have to fix it if they expect us to play. If someone gets, you know, he, he gets the virus, he gets uh, infected, and there has to be a way that not everyone in that group <laughs> is going to be out. Because, for example, how do we play a game without our offensive line? You know, and then we're all going to the dressing room, you know, the dress, even though it's in groups of 25, the kids are going to be in contact. You know, let's face it, kids are going to get it. Well, if the entire group is is out, but now it's down to 10 days, by the way, not four teams, now 10, but that's still two weeks or two games. How do you even play with that scenario? So I think that's something that they're going to try to address. And, I, of course, I don't have an answer, but I sure hope they come up with one. Well, let's just say it's, it's – uh, how much of your plan do you have in by Wednesday, Coach? After practice is over, it Wednesday you should you done Thursday's polish. You know, uh, you know Wednesday the whole plan's in. You know Monday's installed, Tuesday uh, uh, contact practice, and, and Wednesday is a uh, uh, game life situations with kicking scripts and all. So I don't know where you're going. You're saying, well, hey, if it's in Wednesday, hold them Thursday. But you know, I, I, I just feel like that. You know, there was just too much involved. I mean, you, I don't want to miss my quarterback, but I don't want to lose. You know, I don't want to lose Braden Johnson. I don't want to lose my, my right guard, my right tackle, or very good players, you know. So I, I just think we're going to do everything we can to be safe. We're going to do follow all the rules. We're going to do as much as we can to keep the kids' uh, contact minimal and, and wear a mask and do everything we're supposed to do and hope for the best. And hopefully, you know, things will work out. But I'm very concerned about, you know, we get ready to play Manaville in a big game and, you know, <laughs> My, my whole backfield and all my receivers, oh, oh, they quarantined. You know, what happens then, you know? I, I mean, mean, I know what happens. I think it's, it's going to be ugly. You know, Coach, I think, it's, I think it's a good question, even even on the pro level, okay? You get to Thursday, and, uh, you know, you got you got first and second down in, and then on, on, on Friday it's, it's third down in red zone, all right? Sure. But if you'd study sure. that, I don't know how much you've practiced it, but, you know, at that point, if, if, if I got a lot of guys on my team or some guys on my team who have, who have tested positive for COVID, you know, I don't know if I want Drew Brees practicing on Friday. Or, as a, as a stopgap, I might tell Jameis Winston to stay home. Right. You no, know, you know, I think I know. Because all of a sudden, hey, look, the game, the game happens on Sunday, 
and you don't have your starting quarterback. You don't have your starting quarterback, and the other team doesn't have a starting offensive tackle because they're both, um, <coughs> excuse me, positive. Are they going to cancel the game? Yeah, no, I, I don't think they are, and I think it's very much uncharted water, like you said. And I think as we go, we're going to live and learn, and I think what you're saying may very possibly be, be a policy that's adopted by some coaches. You know, if you got to Wednesday and all's good, you know, no. Don't, don't roll the dice, you know, keep them, keep them off the field, keep them away from other kids or whatever your, your group that you're concerned about and, and hope to get them, you know, the Friday night at 7 o'clock. But I, I, don't, I don't have any idea how to proceed with that except I think you're absolutely right. It's something we all have to talk about and, uh, you know, deal with it and, and come up with the best possible way. Yeah. Well, that's uh, Hank Tierney and his thoughts about – What's going to happen, none of us knows. We just know that there's going to be an effort to play, and I think there should be. I'm looking forward to it. We're all looking forward to seeing games. We're all hoping and praying that some mitigation takes place prior to then that helps. Then, of course, there's the games, and there's the legacy. And all of us look at our own legacies at some point in time and say, did I do anything to make a difference? Well, Coach has made a difference in the lives of a lot of young men over an extended period of time. And I'm not suggesting he's near the end at all. I hope he keeps doing it for another 10 years. That's up to him. But when you look at the grand scheme of things, Hank Tierney is 10th all-time and wins in the history of Louisiana high school football. And when you look at the people that are ahead of him, well, there's only eight guys that have ever won 300 games in the history of Louisiana high school football as a head coach. And Coach Hank is approaching that, what, 21 wins away, I think, at this point. And... Coach, do you think about that at all? Is it a tangible goal? I'm sure you're aware of it. If I didn't just make you aware of it, is it something that is on your mind and something that you hope to accomplish? We all have goals. Anybody that says they don't would be a liar. Well, uh, Kenny, honestly, it's not. You know, and I'm going to tell you, you know, it's it's obviously, you know, it's a lot, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of good players and a lot of good coaches that have won a bunch of games. But if you remember, and, Shoot, in 2008, I basically retired from head coaching. <laughs> you know, I went from West Jefferson to uh, to to Pontchartou as Mike Bob Miner's assistant, and I, in my mind, I was going to be an assistant for the rest of my life. And I worked three years as Mike's offensive coordinator, and I enjoyed the heck out of it, Pontchartou. And I really had no desires at all to become a head coach again. I had a lot of opportunities to be. And what happened to be one, but what happened, Mike kind of decided to get out of coaching and it kind of fell in my lap. And really there was no one else to, to take it. I liked the school. I liked the kids. So I took it. So, you know, that head coaching part of me, I, I, I was done with it. But then I've kind of got renewed and reinvigorated with these, these kids at Pachatua. Wonderful town, wonderful kids. So we're moving on. And I think what I'm most excited about is that I think we're going to have a pretty good team the next few years. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get to play because our kids will have a chance to, uh, you know, maybe play for championships if we can continue to improve. But as far as the wins, it would be a great honor. Honestly, I'm not going to tell you it wouldn't be, but do I consciously think about it? I do not. And honestly, someone told me the other day, you know, what it was, and I didn't even know it until, until they told me. You know, I, I, I know there's some losses in there too, some tough ones that I, that I understand y'all talked about last a couple of Saturdays ago, but. Uh, <laughs> But all in all, it was a bunch of fun. <laughs> great rides. Great Yeah, we were having fun with that, by the way. Yeah, just digging them all up and reminiscing about it. Of course, we could dig up the great wins, too. But it's quite a list. When you look at the eight guys that have won 300 or more, uh, J.T. Curtis still doing it. Jim Hightower still doing it. Red Franklin, of course, not. Uh, Don yeah. Chow's deceased. Yeah. Louis Cook still doing it. Vic Dalrymple retired. Racer Halstead deceased dale weiner retired that's the eight guys that have won 300 or more that's a pretty impressive list of guys three of them are still coaching and so are you yeah i mean no doubt every one of those guys you said other than maybe one or two I i've had some contact with coach with uh red franklin in an all-star game and he made a lasting impression on me 30 years ago you know so i'm honored to be even mentioned in the same breath with them guys and uh you know, it, it, it's it's something, obviously, that if it happens, that would be great, you know. But, honestly, my wife and my family would probably enjoy it more than me. But it would be a great thing. And uh, 
you know, obviously if it happens, it does. But like I said, you know, we're concerned about right now trying to get Ponchi to a football back to where we had it a couple of years ago and have a chance to maybe play for a championship. Hank Tierney with us. And, uh, and I, we talked about it on the show two weeks ago, but uh, I wanted to bring it up anyway because at some point you have to not only accept your legacy, but you embrace it too. And I don't think, and I may be wrong, Ed, but I don't think there's any coach in Louisiana that has produced more head coaches than Hank Tierney has. I counted nine, and I'll run down, you know, the list of names. It's pretty impressive when you when you think about it, or at least eight for sure. Maybe I, I'd rule out the ninth because I think we, we talked about Hank worked with Greco, not the other way around. Yeah, Scott well, Hildebrand. Learn from Greco. Learn from Greco. <laughs> okay, yeah. so Scott Hildebrand, Darren Barbier, Jay Roth, Mark Sanji, Billy North, Mike Biamonte, Malter Scobo, and Scott Bain's father. That's eight guys that became right, head coaches. Right, right. Now, did I miss anybody, Hank? Because if I did. You know, off the top you know, of my head, I know Richie Walker was the head coach of Holy Cross for a while. And uh, Richie was our offensive coordinator, a couple of those really – I mean, defense coordinator, a couple of our really good short teams, you know. And uh, Richie's still coaching, actually. He's coaching the Met. But I think that's about that's about everybody, if I'm not mistaken. That's about all of them. And let me be sure – and give credit where credit is due. Those guys, the majority of who were with me, in fact, all of them were with me, with me back in my short days. And, you know, we were we were winning. And what was going on then is that it sure kind of became a place to go, you know, if you wanted to get involved with the program that was winning, you know, and then use the winning, you know, to move on and get a, and get a, either a coordinator's job or a head job. And, and, you know, it was kind of like a train that we really had rolling, and those guys did that. And they were just as, I mean, and contributed as much and were absolutely as important to the success of that program. And all those guys you mentioned, great football coaches, and they were the reason, as much as me, uh, why Shaw won. And those guys came and, and helped us keep winning, and then they all got good jobs, and I encouraged them all to do that. You know, it was like, you know, come with us, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, we're going to have good players. We're going to have a chance to win. And I remember Jay Roth coming. You know, the first time he came, we watched the spring game, we played Covington. And we scored a whole lot of points with a whole lot of good players. And Jay Roth looked at me and said, Coach, I'm in. You know, and, and and Jay was with us for three years and we won a ton of games and Jay went on to a fabulous career at Rumble, you know, and uh those guys did that. They contributed as much as anyone to Shaw winning and then used it to go on and get better jobs. And you know what? That was what I thought coaching was all about. You know, it helped helped those guys careers and it helped Shaw win. You know, it was a win win situation. And I was very fortunate to have those kind of quality people, some of who are still winning, you know, regularly. Well, I look at it, and, Ed, you look at this list. Scott Hildebrand played in a, a state championship game coaching at Hanville. Darren Barbier won state championships at Hanville. Jay Roth won a couple of state championships at Rome. Oh, I just thought of another. Oh, you said Lou Valden, huh? You said Lou, huh? Said Lou. I didn't yeah. say Lou Valden. No, no, I did not. I did not. Yeah, Lou Valden. He won a state Lou championship. Valden. He won a state championship, too. <laughs> He sure did. 1994. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about, so, uh, about it. And then uh, Frank, uh, Frank, Frank Alello, Alello, uh, 2003, Frank Alello coached for you, too, didn't he, Hank? Frank Alello, very, very good coach. Though he's, he's the head coach of East Jefferson now. and uh, He was our receiver coach for a number of years at Shaw and West Jefferson. In fact, I still talk to Frank two, three times a week, doing a great job of rebuilding that East Jefferson program as well. Life Resources Ministries exists for showing men the way, building men to spiritual maturity, and preparing God's people for service. Life Resources Ministries has Bible studies in person and via Skype throughout the metro area, along with outreaches weekly on Wednesdays at Piccadilly Cafeteria on Clearview Parkway in Metairie. There are business forums and fellowship meetings as well. Life Resources also puts on major outreach prayer breakfasts with national speakers up to four to five times per year. Visit us online at liferesources.net. Life Resources Ministries, leaders investing for eternity. The 2019 Volvo XC90 is the most awarded luxury SUV of the century. With seven seats standard, there's room to spread out and space to gather your thoughts. The 2019 Volvo XC90, our idea of luxury. To experience our idea of luxury, visit Bergeron Volvo on Vets in Metairie or online at bergeronvolvo.com today.
To all of us who live down here, eating is one of our favorite pastimes. And for over 40 years, Troy and Cindy Tiffany have been feeding friends and family. It's a great place. I'm talking about the Hobnobber Cafe. Located at 5928 West Metairie Avenue in the West Metairie Shopping Plaza, the Hobnobber is casual, family-friendly neighborhood dining, great American food, Italian dishes, Creole cuisine, and don't forget the burgers and the po' boys and the sumptuous seafood. Somebody said, if you want delicious sit-down meals with your families and you want it New Orleans style, go to the Hobnobber. Always a great meal at a great price, and the daily specials are fabulous. To check out those specials, go to HobnobberCafe.com or on Instagram, Hobnobber Cafe. Now, when you get there, say hi to Troy. Say hi to Cindy and find Ryan and wave at him, too. It's a great place, the Hobnobber, 5928 West Metairie Avenue. It's fun, it's family, and the food is fabulous. Stock up on major savings for back to school now at JCPenney. Shop our BOGO deals on select basics and more for your family. Even select Liz Claiborne towels or buy one, get one free. Plus, get an extra 20% off a coupon. Or find select Nike styles for the family at 25% off. And get 40% off select Levi's for him and her. Plus, shop tax-free this weekend. The savings are top of the class at JCPenney. Tax-free details vary by state. Nike and Levi's excluded from coupon. Offers now valid. Conditions and exclusions apply. See store or jcp.com for details. Shopping should be fun, but that's tough when you're worried about credit. At Aaron's, we make it quick and easy. Before you go, head to apply.aaron's.com to discover your leasing power. You'll immediately know how much you're approved to lease to own. Just apply from your phone or computer, then visit your local Aaron's to shop top brands like Samsung and GE with the confidence of knowing you're already approved. Aaron's, easy, beautiful, affordable. Approval is valid only to sign store location. Not all stores participating. Approval is not guaranteed. Some restrictions apply. Hi, this is Jay Farner, CEO of Rocket Mortgage. Making the right financial decisions has never been more important. We can help guide you to those right decisions now when they matter most. Mortgage rates are near historic lows. So when you call 8338-ROCKET or visit us at rocketmortgage.com to start your refinance, you'll be well on your way to saving money every month. The rate today on our 30-year fixed rate mortgage is 3.375%, APR 3.59%. Right now could be a great time for you to take some positive financial steps forward with a cash-out refinance from Rocket Mortgage, which could give you the boost that you're looking for. In addition, we may be able to help you refinance with little or no out-of-pocket costs. At Rocket Mortgage, we're committed to every client, every time, no exceptions, no excuses, giving you the best mortgage experience. Call us today at 8338-ROCKET or go to rocketmortgage.com to learn more. Rates subject to change. Pay 1.875% fee to receive this discounted rate. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. And MLS number 3030. You want the total sports package? Let's talk prep, college, pro, all sports, all the time. You get it all from the three tailgaters on 1061 Nash Icon, Nash FM 1061.com, and through CrescentCitySports.com with Ken and Ed. Give us a call at 504-260-1061. And we appreciate your patience. Hank Tierney is our guest talking with the legendary coach at Ponchatoula. 260-1061 is the number to call if you'd like to join in the conversation. All right, Hank, we just apologize for cutting off there. But with regard to the, the legacy and all these guys and coaching, we were talking about the fact that when they started with you, most of them were very young. And they all say they learned it all from you. And, and they finally caught up with you when they got better athletes. I know Jay will talk about that. Said I can, he can never beat you because he didn't have good enough players to beat you. And you were too good of a coach. Ultimately, coaching matters. But you can't win unless you have good players. Maybe that's, that's the biggest message there is about anything, right? Yeah, Coach. And you know what, I'm, Kenny, I'm glad you, you mentioned, you know, them guys are uh, very honored that they would say that about me. It would be remiss of me not to mention Joe Zimmerman. 40, 40 years ago, he gave, you know, me a chance to coach. You know, he hired me, and he, he taught me the game of football. And he's been my mentor, and uh, I still talk to him on a regular basis. He still comes to Ponchatoula games. And, you know, I owe so much to him, you know, for uh, for helping me. And it's funny, while we were on the break, Willie Brooks, who's a good friend and a tremendous coach, texted me and said, don't forget Marcus Scott. And I, and, and I can't believe I forgot Marcus. You know, Marcus is now the head coach at Destrahan, and, he was on our staff at West Jefferson, and I knew when he coached with us what a what a great football coach he would be, you know, uh, someone who could sincerely care about the kids and worked really hard. So, uh, excuse me, Marcus, for leaving you out, but uh, 
great, great future, obviously, for Walker Scott. Yeah, I mean, when you say it again, Ed, talk about it again, say it again. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the fact that Vance Joseph, I'm interviewing Vance Joseph. Yeah. He's a head coach. He's a head coach in the NFL. Yeah. And I, I remember when he played quarterback for Hank in the late 80s. And there he is yeah, as a head yeah. coach in the NFL. You know, I mean, that that to me was the one that was like, when I left that interview, I was like, I, I was like, really? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> that that to me was was the one that kind of blew me away. I tell you, uh, I tell you, Ed, uh, you know, tremendous, yeah, obviously, tremendous, one of the smartest kids ever coached. Coach. But the uh, the other two, and of course, we all know Mickey's a receiver coach at LSU. He coached with us at Shaw, and Terry Joseph is is a very very successful right now. He's the DB coach at uh, Notre Dame, and he coached with us at Shaw. And uh, them guys, you know, Terry and Mickey, are, are even headed for bigger things down the road. And, and while Vance never coached, Vance was probably the smartest one of all of them. He skipped the high school coach, and he went right to college in the pro ranks. But uh, I talk to Vance regularly, too, and I'm honestly not surprised that he's done as well as he's done. When you look at what this list represents, when you look at these guys and what they've done, Overall, it's remarkable. I mean, it's just, it's mind-boggling. And I know others, and some people have pointed out to me that others have great coaching trees, too. John Kalbacher was a guy that had a great coaching tree. Joe Zimmerman, who Hank mentioned, certainly was another one of those. You've got guys that have produced head coaches all over the place uh, that have been remarkable. I mean, when Ed and I were in high school, Hank and you were all across and then getting on to coach at Shaw, we were students at Rumble, and you think about that staff that uh, Don Perret had. What was it? Had five guys on one staff that became oh, yeah. head coaches? I mean, it's crazy. Uh, Randy Johnson became a head coach, of course. Easton Roth became a head coach. Henry Rando George Ryan. became a head coach. George Ryan became a head coach. Mark Martin became a head coach. Yeah. Who am I missing? Yeah. And, and what's interesting is that uh, of all the guys, the one that didn't was Potter. He, he was, a, he great was coach. a great coach. And I, I mean, oh, was, yeah. As, as good as coach. coaches I've ever been around, Al Ponop here. As good as coaches I've ever, ever been around. Yeah, and, and at any one time, I'm thinking about your staff, Hank. Did you, what's the most number of head coaches that you had on the same staff? One year we had uh, we had Lou Bowden, Darren Barbier. Um, let's see, we had a whole bunch of good coaches together at one time. Uh one year we had Sanji and Jay Roth on the same staff, uh, Mark and, and Jay. And I, 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 we always had two or three at one And Scott Bainsfall was on that staff as well. I always had two or three at one time that would go on, and then they would, they would leave suddenly and get great jobs, and then we'd replace them with quality guys. But it was kind of a thing that I want to coach at Shaw because I'm going to get a good job. You know. And you mentioned before we, we, got, we lost uh, whatever – about having good players, you know, and that was the thing. I mean, we had okay, we had good players at Shaw, really, really good players, and uh, and and those guys coached good players, and and they, you know, we were able to win some games, and and they, like I said, they went on. But it's it, it's about players, you know. We were two and eight a couple of years ago. We didn't coach any different, you know. We coached the same, maybe even coached harder, you know. But you know, it's it's about having good players on any level, and so I'm excited about the next two years. I think we have pretty good players. Ed? Coach, uh, you, you're looking for big things this year? I mean, you know, it's a year after TJ, but then I think you feel that you're going to play even more games than you won last year, right? Well, you know, Ed, we started nine sophomores on offense. Uh, well, no, not eight sophomores in one year. We returned nine starters on offense. And, and uh, you know, those guys played with TJ. And, and you know, we, we were one play from being a district champion this past year. You know, Mandeville scored on the last play of the game to beat us, so we tied Sidell for the district championship. 
You know, so we won a lot of games, you know, got way behind a desperate hand and showed a lot of character coming back and getting back in the game in the fourth quarter. You know, so uh, they, they've been to war and they all back and a uh, very talented bunch. And, you know, we, we think it will be better. And the good thing is they're mostly all juniors next year. So I think for the next two years we have a chance to be pretty good. And, uh, and you know, we got to work and keep working and keep our staff together, which we've been able to do. And, you know, we're, we're excited, yes. Of course, I did hear Hutch say on the show a couple of weeks ago that they got 18 starters back. So, you know, there's a lot of good teams in our district, you know, so it'll be a dog fight as usual. Well, I, I, remember, excuse me, I remember that game last year because I showed up at the swamp at 645. And one of your coaches said, <laughs> the lightning detector on my phone. And it was just <laughs> So it was like it was like seven forty, seven forty five. I was like, Well, I guess I'm going back to New Orleans. We are not gonna have football and we're pretty as a shame is that game on Saturday was a very good game and not a lot of people saw it. It was but very we, strange because we go on the field at quarter to nine and we're gonna play. And everybody's excited and one of the light pole standards didn't come on. <laughs> so we only had half the lights. So all those people waited to play. We had to toss it the coin, the toss, the coin toss, and everything. And then, bam, the guy moved to ten o'clock the next morning. And it was kind of like playing a JV game. There wasn't too many people there. You know, it was very different. But it was a heck of a game. Give Manville a lot of credit. They drove seventy yards in the last minute to win the game. You know, crazy. Final thought: Your quarterback. You had a great one last year. That's at LSU now, and PJ Finley. Talk about the young man that you got at quarterback now, because I know you feel he's pretty special. Yeah, and, and from what I understand, talking about my buddies at LSU, the TJ is doing very well, you know, and uh give a lot of credit to TJ. He fought through a lot of adversity, you know, playing with a lot of younger guys when he was uh, first came to it. Then we switched offenses. We were an option team, switched to a, a, a spread team to take advantage of his skill set. But uh, TJ is going to be a, a heck of a player at LSU. Tremendous work ethic, you know, a lot of great perseverance, uh, really, really competitive kid, and uh you know, I'm looking for him to do great things there. As far as our, our team next year, we do return a, one of the best athletes I've ever coached in Jacoby Matthews, who's always been a quarterback until he came to Pontchartou, and then he played receiver and safety, obviously did very well at both positions. But he'll be returning a quarterback for the last two years, and we'll still play safety. But uh, has a whole lot of offers being recruited by a ton of folks as a safety and a receiver. But more in line of what I play with at Shaw, you know, more of an option guy, you know, uh, could really run the ball, has a strong arm, you know. So we will, you know, we will still be in the spread, but we'll be more of a, uh, of a, of a run, run pass balance team, and obviously we'll be running a lot more options. We turn a lot of guys on defense to and an outstanding kicker. So you know, we we we're excited about the season, and like y'all said, just so we get a chance to play. You got that right. So as we close. Ed, I think it's it borders on sacrilege that Hank Tierney and Jay Roth ended up running spread offenses. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine? Hey, you Jay and I to talk about it. Turning, about turning, turning over time. to the Red Army. I mean, look, let me tell you what. Yeah. The, it, it'll be, it'll be, uh, what is the Sports Illustrated uh, uh, the sign of the apocalypse? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When J.T. Curtis <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that'll, that'll, that, that'll, that's that'll never be, gonna happen. That'll be the trip we get right there. That'll be a sign of the apocalypse. Because I, I've always asked him, you know, needling him all the time. I'm like, I'm like, coach, you know, what's the deal? And I, I know you want to play football. You're gonna line up in five line, empty. And, and he just looks at me and he's like, <laughs> we we went fun. three games a couple years ago without throwing a pass. And we threw 51 passes in a game two years ago. Mickey Joseph told me one time, we threw more passes in one game than he threw in two seasons at y'all. You know, he's probably right. <laughs> he's probably, probably right. Good coaches adjust to their talent, not the other way around. And, and I'll close on this. I'll laugh because Hank, Hank watches or listens when we're doing games often. And Easton Roth is, loves Hank and is his friend and thinks the world of him. And Easton's, when Jay first switched to doing the spread thing, he went from from you know, running his traditional eye formation and pro set split back, running the ball and throwing it 10 to 15 times a game to throwing it 30 times a game and never took a snap under center in that one season. And they get inside the five-yard line and his father's on the broadcast going nuts because get under center. What are you doing? Get under center. It's like, 
You know, you're at the one yard line. What are you doing in shotgun? Are you crazy? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna let y'all close on this one. I called him one time when I was thinking about going to the spread, and he just won a yeah. trillion games in a row. Guess what Jay told me? Don't do it. Stay with the running game. <laughs> All right. well, I hear you. Yeah. Well, you know, and here's the thing about it. Look, spread's beautiful, and if you have the players, play to your strength because that's your talent level. But here's the reality: in a 12-minute quarter on the high school level, time of possession, especially in the heat of Louisiana, means everything. I believe that. Absolutely. Absolutely, so, no doubt. Run the ball, just, run the ball, run the just, clock. I just clock. debunked your whole theory, and I just, I just tore you apart with your program. It's over with. Man. And also, we, we're gonna run it next year. You gonna see? We're gonna run it. Right. And what I said: run the ball, run the clock, play defense. That's what Joe Zimmerman instilled in me 40 years ago, and that's what we're trying to do again for the next couple of years. There you go. Right. That's a good way to play defense. Don't be on the field. Legendary <laughs> coach. <laughs> It's always a pleasure, Hank, reminiscing and talking about what's to come. You still got game. Keep doing it. You made a great difference in the lives of young people. And, and then I can't imagine you're not doing it. So stick around so we can see you scream about holding for a few more years. Okay. <laughs> hey, thank you guys. Y'all are the best. Y'all are the best for high school football ever. And I am very appreciative and, and, and proud to even be on your show. Thank you again.